Hello, good friends. In a recent video, we mentioned a comment by G.K. Chesterton about Robinson Crusoe. Chesterton said that the best part of the whole book was the list of things that Crusoe managed to save from the shipwreck. And he made the comment, the greatest of poems is an inventory. That seems a bit extreme, actually. A number of us have probably had experience with inventories that we didn't find all that interesting. <laughs> But still, it's a place to start for today because we were talking about how a language is made out of units, that is, established routines or habits or ways of doing things that we've learned. And these units are linguistic, that is, they're either meanings or sounds, there are other things that symbolize meanings, or the combination of those two and that they're conventional, that they have been conventionalized through usage as property of a whole society or a whole group of people. What form do these units take? The answer that the definition we're looking at gives is that they are an inventory. Now, whether it's a poetic inventory or not, maybe it'll be like a lot of inventories, that it's got some interesting stuff in there and you wonder who put the inventory together and why they picked these things and not those things to have in it but it is an inventory. Lanneker chose that term in conscious reaction to another metaphor that was around very much at the time he wrote that, and it's still around quite strongly. A lot of people think of the rules of a language or of the grammar of a language as a machine. It's a machine that spits out grammatical sentences and clauses and phrases and discourses, perhaps. But this machine knows how to make them and to make them just right. And Lanneker says, nope, that's not a very good metaphor to use. It's much better to think of it as a toolbox or as an inventory of building structures. These are things that people use to build sentences and phrases and clauses that aren't, haven't been part of the language yet. But of course, there are some preformed clauses and preformed phrases and even preformed sentences and paragraphs and so on. People use the things that they know that they have learned how to make and how to use. They put them together to make something new. And that's how a language works. But it's the people that do the creative work. And the inventory provides them with the raw materials and the tools to do it. So then, if you're going to learn a language, you're going to have to learn a lot of structures because that is what constitutes the language, the grammar of the language. But remember, that's the meaning of grammar that includes all the structures that make up the language. So it's not just the syntax, but it's also the dictionary, the lexicon. All of those structures are used as raw materials or as tools for building new communications. Now, one of the possible implications of the inventory model that I think actually fits language is the notion that an inventory isn't necessarily the most logical or the most predictable sort of thing you can think of. It's going to have surprises in it for you. On the other hand, it's not the same thing as a stupid or um, arbitrary kind of collection either. Most of the time, an inventory was put together by people and they had reasons for one thing or another. They thought, oh, this looks useful, and they'd put it in the inventory. Or they'd think, hey, that's junk, and throw it out, and that would not be in the inventory. That actually fits pretty well what we find in language. We find things that we would not have expected, things that are surprising, but things that often, if you stop and look at them and think about them a while, or see people using them, you realize, oh, that's what that's good for. Now I get it. On the other hand, it's not predictable. It's not stuff that you know is going to have to be there or that you can demand that must be there in every language. People had their reasons for choosing the particular tool or the particular preformed piece, but it's not 100% predictable that it would be there. On the other hand, some things are close to predictable. Let's take as an example the word shoes. We mentioned it in the last video. Shoes is by no means the most surprising structure that you can find in the English language. Given the well-established noun stem, shoe, and the well-established pattern of pluralizing noun stems by sticking an S or a Z sound on the end of them, shoes is the sort of thing you could very well expect. On the other hand, there are aspects of it that aren't quite so well expected. Compare it with another word that's very expectable, which might be books. What would be the difference if you heard somebody say, 
Did he find his books? Or did he find his shoes? How many books do you think he was looking for? The guy that's being referred to. Well, it's, you know, it could be anywhere between two and I suppose a whole truckload, but you would probably think somewhere two, three, four, five, somewhere in there. Who knows how many? But what about the shoes? Is it likely to be two? Yes. Is it likely to be three? No. Might it be four? Yeah, maybe, but it's more likely to be two. And five is another unlikely number. What's the difference? Well, we know that shoes come in pairs, a left and a right. And if somebody's looking for shoes, it's usually just one pair that they're looking for. Can you predict that from the plural formation rule? No, it doesn't work for books. You might be able to predict it from shoe if you let the meaning of shoe be big enough. And I'm actually one that's inclined to do that. But a lot of the people that want a nice, neat machine to predict things don't. So there we are. But here's a much more profound objection to my mind. Even if you could predict it 100%, even if you claim that everything that is there in shoes comes from the pieces, that doesn't mean people don't have it pre-made anyway. Because people learn to do things that they already know pretty much the parts of how to do. They put together a new structure and then they get used to using that structure and they use it as a whole. They bring it complete out of their inventory and there's nothing to stop them from doing that. It's like a person who knows how to build an envelope out of a piece of paper. That's a neat thing to know how to do. And you can do it and make yourself an envelope anytime you need one. On the other hand, most of the time you just reach in the desk drawer and pull out an envelope that you already have preformed. Why? Because it's easier. Laziness is one of the strongest motivations in linguistics and to my mind, it's a very respectable one. There's nothing in the world wrong with doing things the easy way as long as it works just as well as the harder way, do it the easy way. Why not? And we do it all the time. The important point is that demonstrating how a structure could be put together and perhaps was originally put together does not demonstrate that people don't use it as a whole now. It's quite possible that it was put together very reasonably and logically and they learned it then after that and they keep using it but they use it as a whole rather than uh, putting it together from scratch every time. So then the inventory of conventionalized linguistic units is the toolbox and the materials list that people use to build new structures. And it's also what people use to understand new structures that they hear. They apply these same tools and perceive these same prefabricated parts, and that's how they understand what other people say. The inventory provides them with these materials. Now, what form does the inventory take? The definition uses the word structured, and that is a good word in that it keeps us from thinking that this is just a disorganized pile of tools and of materials. It's structured. And what structures it? Briefly, the answer is relationships. And as those relationships are established through usage as conventional, they themselves become part of the inventory. We will be talking later on about how two of the most fundamental classes of units are things and relations. And these relations that relate things to each other or to other relations structure the inventory. That's their very nature. So the structuring is built into the inventory. It's not something that's imposed on it from outside. One of the most obvious and extremely important kinds of relationships is the relationship between semantic structures and phonological structures. It's not the case that we have just a pile of phonological structures in one part and a pile of meanings in another. No, specific meanings are connected to specific sounds. Over and over and over again, there are thousands and thousands of these relationships, and they structure the inventory. We can use a metaphor of spaces. Lanniker's theory was originally called space grammar, and I think it was a reference to this way of looking at things. And we're going to use this in diagrams very often, so get used to it. We can think of there being a phonological space. We'll separate the phonological space from the semantic space. And any line that crosses the frontier between the two will be a symbolizing link. A link that lets a phonological form symbolize a meaning. Two good examples might be the words donkey and rooster. 
Let me go over with you a few conventions that we're going to be using in a lot of diagrams. One of them is to represent the meaning with drawings. We're not claiming that the meaning is limited to what is in the drawing, but that what is drawn will be recognizable as an example of the class of structures that the word designates. It's not that meanings are limited to images, but they do often saliently and centrally involve images, and when that's the case, we might as well draw a picture. It's at least better than just writing the word out in English with capital letters, which is often done. That's not a bad thing either, but just uh, this is better. The drawings are colored red and made with rather thick lines in order to make them stand out because they are representing the designatum or named entity. Another term we'll use is the profiled element. Meanings often have a lot of things besides the named or profiled entity, but we'll try to mark the profiled entity by drawing it in red and bold facing it. The sound is going to be represented in a font that is italicized and is colored green. And it's not spelled according to English orthography, but rather according to the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, that is. If you don't know the IPA, there are lots of sites that explain it. You can also look at the videos that Holly and I did. But it should be fairly clear in any case what's trying to be represented. Now it's an interesting fact, and actually it's kind of important, that sometimes a meaning can be in phonological space. If you think of a word like scream, what's the designatum? It's a sound. And we mentioned in another video onomatopoeic forms like cock-a-doodle-doo. Think of that one. Again, the meaning is a sound, as well as the phonological form being a sound. It's undoubtedly correct to see phonological space as enclosed within semantic space or enclosed within general cognitive space. And semantic structures can be in any part of that, including phonological space. A limiting case is when the sound can actually designate itself or when the same sound can function both as a meaning and as a phonological sound. In the right context, you can make any phonological pole refer to itself or designate itself. All you have to do is start talking about phonetics. ¿Qué otra palabra te gusta? Uh huh. Um, strengths. Okay. Ooh, muchísimas okay. consonantes. Sí. Strengths. Clearly, in this context, Holly and I were focusing on the phonological pole of the word strengths, which is notable because it has six or seven consonants to one vowel. I would diagram that particular usage of the word strengths as follows. The phonological pole would be the phonological pole, and there still is a connection to the meaning of strengths for both Holly and me. But we weren't focusing on that. What we were focusing on was the sound, and we wanted to put front and center designated the sound of the word, which is where you will find those many consonants that she comments about, or the six or seven consonants that I was commenting about just now. What is usually the meaning of the word strengths is basically irrelevant in this context. It's backgrounded so much that we don't need to pay any attention to it. Another interesting example is an English construction that lets you talk about sounds that aren't even established as part of the phonological system. For instance, you can say, well, he kind of choked and he went, <coughs> What is the sound and what is the meaning of <coughs> It's pretty clearly both sound and meaning. The sound that the speaker makes and the sound he's trying to convey should be taken as the same thing. Notice one other convention. We're using a rectangle with rounded corners and a non-continuous line to represent a structure that's not yet entrenched in the language. So then, let's look at three different types. The more normal type would be a word like house, where you've got a sound and then a meaning that's outside of phonological space. But a word like scream has a meaning and part of the meaning is outside of phonological space. You understand that there's somebody that has to be screaming, but the scream itself, the designated or profiled element, is within phonological space. And then the final case is a self-referential sound, which could be something like that <coughs> sound that we've written HGHG. All of these are legitimate symbols. All of them have a symbolic linkage or a symbolizing linkage that links a meaning to a signifying sound. 
and those linkages help structure the inventory of units which constitutes the language. We'll be talking later about how the symbolic linkages are a kind of association, and there are associations all over the place. Another kind that structures the inventory is the kind that we've represented here between the person that screams and the scream. That line is just representing an association between the sound of a scream and the mouth of the person who is screaming. It's just a linkage between one part of the meaning and another part. And, and there are such associations all over the place in semantics. Think of the words rooster and cockadoodle-doo. They are related. They're related much as the person who screams and the scream are related. There's an understanding that the sound comes out of the mouth of the rooster. I've represented this in what we'll call a compacted representation, but I'd like to show you an exploded representation of the same thing. The main difference in this case is that we show as part of the meaning of cockadoodle-doo, the reference to the rooster. And part of the meaning of rooster is a reference to the sound that the rooster typically makes. Um, you can see from which one is made profiled, which one is designated, which one is the named entity in each case. These two ways of representing these meanings are intended to be just notational variants. So when you see an arrow that looks like a capital A lying on its side, understand that on one side is a compacted representation and on the other side is an exploded representation. The exploded representation is on the side where the two lines of the A are wider apart. In any case, the linkages are there but note also now that we have a dotted line going between the two representations of the rooster and the two representations of the rooster's call. These also will be showing up quite often in our diagrams. They're another form of a semantic linkage. Clearly the two representations of the rooster are understood to be the same and the two representations of the rooster's call. All of these relationships then, the relationships of association, the relationships of identity, the relationships of symbolization, structure the inventory. So, a language is composed of a structured inventory of conventionalized linguistic units. I hope it's clearer now what the implications of that statement are. Again, I'll say goodbye to you all and um, leave you with a list of vocabulary and a list of diagramming conventions and a little quiz to make sure that you've got them understood pretty well. And we'll see you back one of these days for another session in this course of linguistics.